the evening for our first webinar in a two part series with great power comes great responsibility hosted by the ISPCC. The ISPCC is a partner in the Irish Safer Internet Centre whose vision is a positive and inclusive digital world where children are safe and protected. And we're delighted that this webinar series is co-funded by the European Union and we're delivering it today on World Mental Health Day. This webinar series aims to tackle critical thinking skills that will help you and your young person to be safe online and to keep that balance in play. My name is Siobhan Harvey and I'm the parenting lead with the ISPCC and I'm delighted to be joined this evening with my colleagues Victoria Housen and Neve Clark who are both community engagement managers. First of all just before we get started I just want to run through one or two housekeeping bits and then I'm going to briefly uh, give an overview of the different ISPCC services and programs. So first of all you'll have noticed that all participants have been placed on mute and their cameras have been turned off and it will stay like this for the duration of the uh, webinar this evening. We do have a Q&A function so if you have any questions or you're unsure of anything just pop the question into the Q&A feature at the top and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. And if we don't get to your answer to answer your question or if you don't feel like asking one here tonight, you can contact us after the webinar. We will put up our contact details as well. And I just like to remind everybody that the webinar here this evening is being recorded and it will be made available on all ISPCC digital platforms. So just to tell you a little bit about the suite of services that ISPCC offer, we're probably best known for our child and listening service, which is a service for children and young people up to the age of 18, and they can access this service via phone and chat 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Our other service is our Childline Therapeutic Support Service, and this provides therapeutic support to children, young people and their families. And this can mean a place of their choosing where they feel most comfortable, so that might be in their own family home, the community centre, or online, or maybe in school. And we have this um, service in various locations throughout the country. Some of the programmes that we have on offer is our Smart Moves and our Smart Moves is a school's transition programme which aims to support the emotional resilience of children as they prepare to transition from primary to secondary school. We also have our Shield which is an anti-bullying programme which aims to support schools and organisations in their efforts to proactively manage bullying. And some of our newer programmes, which delighted to talk about, and especially on today being World Mental Health Day, is our digital mental health and wellbeing programmes. And these are aimed at reducing anxiety for children and young people. And we also have digital programmes for parents and carers around managing their own anxiety while supporting their anxious child or teen. And then the supports that we offer for parents, we have our parenting hub on the ISPCC uh, website and that publishes articles in relation to parenting and parenting supports. And we also have a support line, which is a listening service offering information, advice and emotional support to parents and carers. And this is opened Monday to Friday from nine o'clock to, to one o'clock. So if you'd like any more information on any of our services, if you just log on to www.ispcc.ie, you'll find out a lot more. So I'm going to hand over to Victoria in a moment, but first of all, I would like to talk about one question that comes up so many times in my daily work with, with parents, um, and I hear it so much. At what age can I let my child access social media? My response is generally always the same. Children don't just become ready for social media at a certain age. Readiness for social media is based on more important factors than age. So what I would say is rather than asking when is the right age to start using social media, focus on how can I prepare my child for social media? So just a few little factors that would be really good to consider when you're thinking about this would be thinking about your child, your young person, what's their personality and temperament like? What's their ability to interpret online communication and their sense of self? And also then focusing on their ability to cope with comparison, their ability to understand that social media is simply the highlight of what people choose to share online. And then lastly, maybe to look at what is their capacity to cope with feelings such as jealousy, inadequacy or feeling left out. So really, there is no golden age of readiness for social media. A recent study conducted by Oxford University based on data from more than 17,000 teenagers from the UK, US and from Ireland found very little evidence of a relationship between screen time and well-being in adolescents. The researchers found that adolescents' total screen time per day had little impact on their mental health. 
And the study also demonstrated that digital technology use accounts for less than half a percent of young persons' negative mental health. So although we know from studies like this and from others that screen time is not the primary driver of mental illness, the dangers of online can have an enormous impact on our young people and on their Hi everybody, we seem to have lost Siobhan there. So what we might do now is just move on to Victoria, if that's okay. And uh, Victoria, you can start doing your presentation piece there on critical thinking. Thank you so much, Niamh. Um That's brilliant. I'm just going to have the slides up there now, just a second. Great, I think that slide is showing there now. So hi everybody, as Siobhan said, my name is Victoria uh, Housen and I'm a Community Engagement Manager with ISPCC. So when we're talking about critical thinking online, we're living in an age where we have entertainment, knowledge and so much more at our fingertips, 24 hours a day. So through our smart devices, there's never been a time in history when we could connect with others, um, so review material or zone out on media as much as we can at this period in our lives. So. Our children's brains are even starting to adapt to a whole new way of life that sees children picking up skills about smart device usage, such as phones and iPads, quicker than skills required for even like learning how to read. So as a parent or as a caregiver, you are all too aware of the dangers that can come with this wonderful age of enlightenment and technological advances, because there are, there are advancements and there are a lot of positives as well, um, some of which that I'll talk about a little bit later. And you probably strive daily to toe the line and keep a balance between allowing certain amounts of access to the online world and putting in enough safeguards and boundaries and um, I suppose restrictions to ensure that your child or young person is still safe online. So what this webinar series really is, is looking at dealing with overall is that we want to help you to help your child or young person to be on to be safe online and keep that balance in play. So the age of information overload is here and it's here to stay. Um, and you know, with it comes much information and uh, you know, a, a, again, a lot of facts and a lot of greatness, but also it comes a lot of misinformation. So TikTok, Instagram, X, Meta, um, they've all become a daily stream of where we get our news. And like how to videos, recipes, tutorials, um, tracking what friends and family or celebrities are doing in their lives. Um, all of this has kind of become the norm. There are of course positives, like as I mentioned earlier on, we, um, I'll talk a bit more about those later, but these interactions and services, um, you know, I, I, I suppose to quote um, what this uh, webinar series name is from Uncle Ben from Spider-Man, um, with great power comes great responsibility. So allowing this information, this 24 access into our homes and into our schools and our communities and allowing it to kind of cluttering up all our minds without the proper tools that come with critical thinking can cause issues to our mental, physical and emotional health maybe even financial security um, and in some cases um, a naivety in specific topics. A lot of this we saw um, when we think of uh, COVID um, in the past couple of years and even with things to do with uh, elections in other countries. So if, for example, you're online to find out information about what is happening in one country right now, you will have many different sources cited in your search engine. So based on your algorithm of who and what type of content you already subscribe to. So what I mean by already subscribe to is um, all sites that you already are more frequent to visit um, or, you know, um, sites that you're all more likely to click on. Um, combined with the most hits and searches on that topic to date, you will get all that information um, to you for the question that you've asked. But again, without putting on your critical thinking hat, you may not think to check a few key points. And this is kind of what we're going to be talking about in the webinar tonight and also what we're going to be talking about with um, the, the, our children and our young people um, in the next part of our series. So some of these points are where is the source of information coming from? So when we Google something or when we're looking up a how to video on YouTube or TikTok, having that thought in our heads of, well, where is this information coming from? Who, who is this source? 
What are the intentions behind the information being given? So the agenda of the people or the organization giving the information. A lot of the times we can sometimes have the assumption that when we go online to search for something that you know the search engines we're using or the people that we're going to have our best intentions in mind and that's a lot of the times because they want us to feel that way and so sometimes it's really good when we're talking about critical thinking to again just have that question in our mind what is the agenda of the people or the organizations that give that are giving that information to us are there paid ads or are the sources providing the information information being influenced by monetary means? Again, some of us might have already kind of had this in our periphery. Um, some of us have, might already have come across this in the news in the last few years. Again, talking about big things like COVID um, and talking about other general, um, as I said, kind of elections in other countries or the social media sites that we use. Oftentimes we don't think about the ads that we're seeing or the information that we're getting. So even for example, sometimes on your own social media pages or on your children, young people's social media pages, you might have things like ads coming up for um, holidays abroad. You might have um, ads coming up for um, the latest in, uh, in technology, the latest iPhone, etc. Um, but again, a lot of the times we don't think about well, where are those ads coming from? Who are funding those ads? And that's again, where critical thinking can really help us. Is it opinion or fact? Are our sources anecdotal or evidence-based? So for example, here in ISBCC, myself, Neov, Siobhan, we um, have to make sure that any work that we present, the work presented here tonight, um, or any work presented on any sites, needs to be evidence based. So what that means is, is that we've put research into looking at what evidence is out there on certain topics and then we share it and then we put it up there. It doesn't matter what my opinion is on the subject. It doesn't matter what Neve's opinion is. It doesn't matter what Siobhan's opinion is. Um, it's what the evidence is telling us. And often in the world we're living in now, as I mentioned, we have all this information out there, but a lot of the times we don't actually think about where is that information coming from? The sources that we're using, are they um, again using evidence based methods or is it their opinion? Is it something that they really truly believe? And in some cases, it's lovely to have people's opinions or anecdotes when especially when we're talking about our children and, you know, um, wanting to hear about what other parents and caregivers are doing is a lovely way of maybe hearing anecdotal information, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right information on that topic um, or that it's the right information for you in the context of how you live your life or what's best for you. So that's another point to think about. Is it opinion or fact? And the last uh, key point that we're going to have uh, talking about critical thinking is have you looked at the at both sides of the coin? As human beings, I think we all can be guilty of thinking of our own opinions um, uh, as, as, as the right opinions um, and also wanting sometimes to um, get reinforcement for those opinions. So if I have a belief that I think Ryan Reynolds is one of the best actors in the world, I don't really want to hear any other opinions on it. I want to hear other people talking about how, yeah, I think he's a great actor. I think he's really funny. He's really, really good in all those movies, etc. And oftentimes we usually keep to those circles that have the same opinions of ourselves. It's how we connect. It's how our children and young people connect with their friends is having the same opinions. And we know how important peer groups are to children and young people. So this point in, in particular can be very important to, to think about when you're talking about online safety with your young person or child. Have you looked at both sides of the coin? Have you looked at both arguments? Don't just go for the or the sources or the arguments that already prove what you feel or what you think. Hear out the other side. Sometimes when we're uh, talking about critical thinking and we're talking about how we can think critically, we need to be able to take a step back and hear other arguments so that we have a balanced approach to the information that's given to us. And again, when we're talking about online safety, this point is really important because oftentimes, um, I suppose again, talking about that word algorithms or talking about what we've already looked up online, you know, it's 
in a way, and not to sound too scary, but a lot of the times the uh, what's happening online is it's learning from us. It's, you know, there are algorithms out there on certain sites to take into account what we're looking at, what we already like, what we're interested in, etc. So it's really important to be open to hearing other views and looking at different aspects of a uh, uh, something we're looking up a bit of information maybe it could just be um, something that's happening in the news um, or it could be something even just you know something about a celebrity a story that's come out it's seeing other stories and seeing other agendas so when we think talking about critical thinking critical thinking happens when individuals draw on their existing knowledge and experience as well as their problem solving skills to do things like compare and contrast, explain why things happen, um, evaluate ideas and form opinions, understand the perspectives of others. Often when we're in person with people, we can find that a little bit easier. But when we're online, we don't always find it as easy to understand the perspective as a, uh, perspectives of others. And this is where it can come uh, into online safety and being a little bit dangerous because oftentimes people feel protected by the anonymity that comes with being online and we feel like we can say things that we wouldn't normally say in person but it also sometimes means that we feel like we can discount what people are saying that again we wouldn't maybe discount it if they were in person in front of us and predict what will happen in the future so critical thinking also helps us to kind of predict what will happen in the future so Again, when we're thinking of things critically, when those five points become part of our kind of habit, um, which will take time and it does take, you know, again, sometimes just reviewing, looking at those five points and maybe writing them down, talking about them and sometimes, you know, using one maybe over the other, depending on what you do in your daily life more than the others. Um, but it will actually help you um, to, to do it automatically, I suppose, to have that critical thinking in every aspect of your life, not just sometimes online, um, but it help you pre uh, predict future trends. So just some general tips about how to help with critical thinking. Always vet new information with a cautious eye. So again, what that means is it's just, it's not being um, I suppose having to think about being skeptical all the time or judging everything or not trusting things, but it just means to have that step back, to have that little bit of a pause and think about the story that we're being told and just to be cautious about it. Look at where the information has come from. Again, we kind of talked about that, but again, it's just very important that again, in our daily lives, when you have somebody who maybe you know, um, a friend or um, a neighbor who, you know, sometimes gets stories and they tell you straight away without maybe checking the facts, you kind of know to take it with a pinch of salt. You know, if Sally down the road tells you something and you're used to kind of Sally being a little bit exaggeratory about things, you're kind of going, well, maybe that actually didn't happen. It's, you know, you're being critical already. It's intuitive. But when we're online, that intuitiveness goes out the window sometimes for ourselves and our young people. So that's why we need to talk about it. We need to talk about where is that information coming from? Can it be trusted? Should we have a cautious eye? And again, we practice active listening when we're talking about these types of um, skills. So critical thinking is a skill and we need to be active in our listening to our children and our young people about what they're uh, seeing online, what's happening for them online, and um, so we can help them to take a critical stance on it. Uh, gather additional information. That's also another really helpful point when it comes to critical thinking. Um, we are living in very busy lives. There is so much now being thrown at us, especially as parents and caregivers, that it is often difficult to try to get more information on a source. It's easier. It's completely it's it that's just goes without saying it's so much easier to just take it at face value just hear the fact look it up uh, at once on our phone and just say, yeah, that's great. That's now I know that story. Um, gathering a few bits more of information, taking that couple of extra minutes sometimes to just review something again, or again, check up at another source rather than just the first um, link that you went, that you that came up for you can be really, really helpful. Asking questions. We should ask questions so that we encourage our children, and young people to ask questions about what's going on, on in the online world. Again, in our own world, it kind of comes intuitively that we ask questions. We ask what's happening around us, why people do the things they do. But again, it doesn't sometimes come as easily when we're online and we need to ask questions. 
So when we're talking about critical thinking and we're talking about some of the reasons why we need to have critical thinking, we can worry about, well, why is this so important? What are our children, young people doing online? Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of positives to what our children, young people are doing online as well as some of the things we might have to be a bit cautious of. So, you know, children, young people can play games online with friends that they know in person, um, but they can also play um, with friends that maybe that they've actually never met in person. And again, that's where the kind of using the critical thinking, thinking about who this person is, where are they coming from? You know, what are their what, what other sources do we have of that this person is who they say they are? Um, other things that we can do online, streaming, watching TV shows, movies online and um, all this, which is wonderful. Again, though, this can also be um, a, an area where we can be cautious of when we're streaming, when we're when we're watching TV, when we're watching um, uh, shows online and, and we're doing that. Again, this is a, it's a wonderful value of entertainment there and that's kind of safe enough, um, but it's what are we watching? What have we been sitting down and streaming online? Um, what is the content that we're taking in? Again, when your child or young person is maybe watching something on the family television in the sitting room or in the kitchen, it's a little bit easier to kind of see, oh, well, this is what they're watching. This is the content that they're taking in. When it's on a device, it can be a bit more difficult. And that's why critical thinking, again, can really help us in these areas. Nowadays, children, young people have to do um, a lot of homework online. So, you know, before you, uh, our own parents uh, might have actually, you know, handed us a dictionary or an encyclopedia, or you had to go to the library. That's not as, as as much of the norm anymore. So instead of trying to fight that, we need to embrace the fact that there are a lot of benefits to being able to look online and use online as a source of information. But again, it's where critical thinking can come in, can really help us in making sure we're looking up and finding the right information for us and safe information. So we have some of the benefits, so such as the fact that um, there's a lot of entertainment value. There's children are digital natives as well. We have to take that into account. As I said, that there a lot of them would have to use it for homework now. They're on it a lot more than we ever have been in the past ourselves. Um, so we need to understand that that they are what we call digital natives. They are using technology in their daily lives. So we need to uh, factor that in as a parent or as a caregiver in how we. Um, make sure they're staying safe and make sure that they're doing the right things online. So again, critical thinking can be really help for that and taking into account as well that there are some risks that we need to be aware of as parents and caregivers. So exposure to inappropriate content, um, cyberbullying, um, that can again with the wonderfulness uh, that the internet brings us of social media etc things like that can happen um, overexposure to screens uh, dependency or addiction to technological devices using the internet again this isn't as much of a worry as um, sometimes we're made to believe um, when it comes to uh, addiction of technology or devices um, but again it's it is something there to be aware of and it's something for us to be cautious of as parents and caregivers that you know what we're wanting our child or young person to do is again wear the critical thinking hat and think you know what have I done today in my day you know what did I how much time did I spend on a device today and what other things could I have been what could I have done instead you know asking those questions being curious we also have general IT hazards so Again, we might have heard ourselves already that in the news, sometimes you hear these stories of children, young people being online and using um, parents or caregivers accounts or their own accounts to buy things online, um, to uh, to order things that their parents and caregivers uh, don't know about. Um, so all of those types of issues of online as well, we need to be aware of. So now that we've talked about some of the positives and some of the more things, uh, things to be cautious of about online, uh, what can we do as parents and caregivers? What are some actual evidence-based tips and skills that we can use to help us with critical thinking um, and to help with online safety for a child or young person? Now, again, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, on our next webinar, but just some general tips. Discovering the internet together can be really useful. So when we have a child or young person, as Siobhan mentioned earlier, there is not necessarily a set time in their lives where you can say, yes, 
take the online world and go for it. It depends very much on your child or young person. What is their personality? What are what is uh, their peer group? What are their competencies already with online uh, usage? You know, that is your, you are the expert. We wouldn't be able to tell you that you as the parent or caregiver would because you're the expert of your child. So you'll know how much um, uh, that they'll need to kind of know around this and what age they're going to be ready for this. But whatever age you choose, discovering the internet together can be really useful. So, you know, as I mentioned, children, young people are digital natives already. So by coming to this webinar tonight, you're already taking a huge step in developing your understanding of what the online world is. If you do not know how to use the internet, try to attend a computer class in your local area. A lot of community centers have them. Um, or even just again talk to a friend yourself or a family member or even your in your school uh, in schools um libraries as well have a lot of resources on how we as adults can become uh closer to being digital native so we can discover the internet and online um advantages and disadvantages together with our child or young person Prior to purchasing a device for your child um, or young person, so example, um, a laptop or a smartphone, um, discuss the boundaries beforehand with your child. It's OK if you already have a device and you haven't had this conversation. There's no um, critical time point for it, so you can have that conversation now, um, but it can be helpful for any of you who haven't bought that device yet to talk about the parameters and the boundaries beforehand. So putting it out there that, you know, because you are um, worried about them, that you love them, that you care about them, that you want to make sure that there are boundaries involved with um, their online usage. So talking about that beforehand can be really helpful. When your child is online, um, you can create boundaries and parameters that are very practical. Um, now we actually, um, on uh, the ISPC website, we have a uh, digital tool that you as a parent or caregiver can do to see how equipped you are um, with your uh, uh, knowledge on on the digital kind of word so world so it's the ISPCC digital ready hub um, so that's your destination for trusted information on how you can support children and young people to have more positive experiences online and this will help to see where you're at when it comes to your online knowledge you probably have way more than you think you do um, again we all are on our phones and our laptops tops a lot more than we ever have been before and there are a lot of benefits for that but again for the the times that we are um, feeling doubt or the time that we are worried about what our child or young person is doing talking about it being curious and learning together are huge tools in your arsenal as a parent or a caregiver that we sometimes underutilize and bringing these key points of critical thinking into our our, our own personal usage of the online world and for our children young people can be huge steps in conquering the online world as well so i think i'm going to pass you now over to my colleague neve um who's going to round up our session for this evening thanks very much victoria um thanks for sharing such insightful information and um, we really hope that everybody watching here tonight has taken as much away from this as i have listening to victoria um and we know there's a lot to take in so i will share contact details um in a few moments if you do want to reach out to victoria siobhan or myself after this session or in the coming days so what um, we're going to do is move on to a Q&A session now with you, Victoria, as well, if that's OK. So we've there's uh, a box there if people want to pop in and um, ask their questions. But if, there was a couple of questions came in by email um, there as we were doing the webinar. So, Victoria, there was first question that came in was you mentioned at the beginning about research. Um, and or, or there was a mention about research and screen time and mental health and young people. So can you tell me more about where we can find out about that research? So 
Yes, of course, Niamh. Yeah. So um, I think Siobhan was mentioning that and, and it's a really um, important thing that a lot of parents and caregivers do ask us. I know it's it's something that um, I myself get asked by parents and caregivers anytime we do a talk like this. So the University of Oxford website, um, they have some wonderful research um, that, that can be really helpful. Um, but also from an Irish perspective as well, growing up in Ireland, if you just type that into Google, you'll find a lot of research around um, uh, basically in, from an Irish context what's going on for children and young people in a lot of aspects of daily life when it comes to resilience schools but also about online safety as well. Fantastic that's fantastic Victoria thanks a million. Um, another question that came in as well I try my best at home to teach my child my 12 year old child how to be responsible and safe online but my concern is their friends don't seem to behave in the same way online and my daughter feels I'm being very strict. Do you have any advice or tips on this? Oh, I think that's a that's a question that a lot of parents and caregivers probably could relate to. Oftentimes when you set a boundary in your household or you set a rule, um, if another parent um, or caregivers, you know, other people in the school or in the community aren't doing it, you can often feel that pressure to either given we see this even with parents trying to buy smart devices so sometimes having you know ground rules that you've talked about with your child or young person first can help with this it can help with their understanding because a lot of times children young people they actually just don't fully hear it from us I know that sounds crazy because you might have as a parent caregiver said it so many times but actually sitting down and explaining where that rule comes from because it's for your safety because it's it's something that we in this family know is going to be protect you when you're online and we care about you in this family things like that those phrasings can be really helpful when you're explaining about your concerns about online and hearing what they have to say um oftentimes children young people actually do have really great arguments in this area of why yeah. they feel that they should be allowed to 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 do something online and hearing them out and being able to have a discussion about it can be really helpful um and i think as well yourselves will probably agree with me that schools often have um, already things in place that can help to keep all parents and caregivers in the loop with what's going what they recommend I suppose for online safety and this can help keep all parents and caregivers on track and I suppose feel like you're you're, you're in it together. Absolutely absolutely so it's around kind of helping resource yourself as a parent as well because it can be a bit of pressure your young person can put pressure on you to uh, you know go online and to be uh, downloading certain sites so it's uh, about using the resources you can around you um there was another one it, it's slightly off around the new tv ad um around consent and, and sharing images actually and threatening to share images um is now a crime and i'm a parent of a 15 year old boy and i'm really worried about what would happen if he sends or receives inappropriate images so do you have any tips or advice around that one again that is uh the that is a crime it is and it's one of those things where um a lot of times it's the threat of it um can sometimes stop our child or young person from um telling us about those things because it, it is it's a it's it's threatening behavior it's something that incorporates feeling embarrassed or shame um so keeping in the mind all of these things as a parent or, or, or caregiver that when your child or young person is dealing with something like this uh so i think you said threatening to share images yeah um you know that is something that it's incredibly serious um, but either if you're the person who shared the image or you're the person who the image has been shared of, thinking about those emotions wrapped around it, the shame, embarrassment, the implications of it for your child or young person, um, it's very, very important that you take that seriously and that again we have that conversation, we have a discussion and we sit down about it and again to kind of highlight the seriousness of it, Going to the uh, Gardaí, that might sound like such an extreme when we're talking about this, but they are trained and know what to do in this situation. There are ways of being able to protect yourself online from these things or being able to basically have um, something in place to help with this if, say, an image is shared um, or if, again, you've you've been the one sharing the image. So it's trying to come at it from a non-judgmental point of view, which can be very hard. So sometimes mm -hmm. when you're having these types of conversations, I think Siobhan and Niamh, you'll agree, um, maybe having a conversation with somebody you trust as well first before talking to your young person can also be helpful in these situations because when you go to talk to them, it has to be in that space of non-judgment and 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 being able to have some of the answers, which is very hard as a parent or caregiver, I'm not going to lie. So that's why sometimes taking care of your own 
mental health around this and taking care of your, yourself first can be really helpful to make you um, prepared for that conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Nobody's an expert, so it's to reach out to others um, that might have more expertise in that area and help you be, be able to have those conversations with your young people. Okay. Um, Victoria, there's just another uh, good question actually that came in. So we're running the webinar on Thursday evening for young people aged 12 plus. So can we give a quick, quick overshot about what this webinar is going, what the content's going to be for that webinar for the young people joining us with their parents? Of course, yeah, that's a great question. And yeah. I can, again, I kind of alluded to it earlier on. We will be talking about the critical thinking points, but from a child centered point of view. So hopefully what will you gain from that is your young person hearing what you've heard tonight, but from, I suppose, again, um, people that aren't yourself that can be really helpful as a parent or caregiver sometimes because you can feel like oh I've said this already and if sometimes if someone else says it in a different way um, or they even have a chance to ask a question themselves that can be so useful so we will be talking again about the critical thinking hat and how we wear that but again mm -hmm. from a child-centered point of view uh, and you can also be there alongside them so that we're kind of putting into practice what we're preaching is discovering the internet together and taking this journey together. Fantastic. That sounds great. Um, I don't see any other questions that have come in now. So what we might do is um, conclude tonight's webinar and we'd like to say a big thank you to everybody watching and to remind you again of the next webinar that is taking place this coming Thursday at 7 p.m. And this is aimed at young people aged 12 plus and their parents and carers, as Victoria already said, can join us. So if you haven't registered your young person for this, you can do so on our ISPCC website or you can keep an eye out on our social media as we will be advertising this webinar again um, in the next day or two as well. So we look forward to seeing you and your young person on Thursday and we hope you can all join us. So lastly, just behind me, you'll see the suite of services. So it's just a quick reminder of the services that we do have available that uh, parents, young people and schools can avail of if they want to make contact with us. Um, if you have any questions or if you want to reach out to us for any reason around parenting support, um, you can contact any of us here at the community engagement team. So there's Siobhan Harvey and her email address is there, Victoria Housen and myself, Neve Clark. And we'd like to thank you again and we hope you all have a lovely evening. Take care.